good evening on behalf of nias director faculty staff and students of nias i welcome all of you for this 12th raja ramana memorial lecture we have uh, professor g padmanabhan with us for delivering the special lecture he'll be speaking on the topic of science technology and health uh, this year this memorial talk is organized as a part of the ongoing nias dst training program on science technology and society multidisciplinary perspectives we are very happy to have dr ramana's family with us today mrs malti ramana and nirupama ramana both of them are here thank you ma'am uh, professor shikantan uh, will be chairing the session today and he has been a close associate of dr ramana for many years um, so i request professor shikantan to uh, chair the session but before that uh, the director uh, will speak a few words uh, about uh, about the session today thank you good evening to all of you welcome to nias we are all working on the foundation which was provided to us by professor raja ramana and jrd tata inspiration and the foundation is ever increasing as the challenges in the country are increasing this one of a very important event in nias when we have the raja ramana memorial lecture and this year the memorial lecture is being delivered by professor g padmanabhan and a subject which touches all of us and where we can all participate we are also th happy with the presence of mrs raja ramana mrs malati ramana and the members of the ramana family and like you i am looking forward to the lecture by prasad ji padmanabhan and steering of the lecture and his own recalling his own association professor b v srikantan the association with raja ramana professor b v srikantan and professor g padmanabhan please good evening it's been a great pleasure for me to be here today and uh, talk about dr raja ramana who is the founder director of uh, this institute i have known dr raja ramana since uh, the day he arrived from england after completing his uh, phd in 1959 one evening late in the evening around 7 o'clock he dropped in at the tfr building and then somebody brought him to me i did not know him at that time and he and one professor roy both of them came together in heavy navy blue suits i can't forget the days uh, incident that is almost uh, 67 years ago and that is uh, a remarkable day for me because we were associated in many different capacities he was first of all a professor at the tata institute of fundamental research then he went over to uh, dae became the director of the bark the bhava atomic research center and later on he was in the defense and so many different uh, activities he was involved in i will not talk about those things because i have very little time i have had the opportunity to write a book about him this is uh, essentially insa asked me to uh, as part of the memoirs to write an article about dr raja ramana and then i wrote that article later on the bhartiya vidya bhavan here gandhi center they wanted to publish it as a book with some more inputs from uh, some others uh, dr shakuntala narsimhan who had known him as a musician and also some others have uh, added a little bit here that book is there which will tell you uh, the biography of uh, dr raja ramana very well but i would like to just summarize a few things uh, which are of relevance to us today dr raja ramana became the first director of this institute jrd tata was responsible for dragging him here because he had just retired 
and then he wanted a suitable person to start a new institution. And uh, so it was Jardi's idea to bring him here. And uh, Dr. Rajaramana pulled me here when I returned. That is how it happened. Then, in the last uh, so 25, 20, uh, in almost 30 years now, this institute has grown from strength to strength. And uh, the influence and the imprint of Dr. Rajaramana is still very much there because he was responsible for uh, working out how this institute should function and how it uh, should develop. Now, I would like to read a statement by Abdul Kalam, our former president, about Dr. Rajaramana. A towering and multifaceted personality, multifaceted personality, Dr. Rajaramanna was always keen to contribute to national development with a sense of mission in any capacity, which was evident in his role as a university as a universe, uh, I'm sorry, as a union minister and member of parliament. For us, in the science and technology community, Dr. Ramana was always a source of inspiration and guidance. Then P.K. Angar, who was also his student and who succeeded Dr. Rajaramana as uh, director of BARC and later on chairman of Atomic Energy Commission, he writes, <coughs> out of the uncertain beginnings in the 50s, if we have today achieved the status of a developed country in nuclear science and technology, it is in large measure a consequence of Dr. Radharamana's ideals, policies, and efforts. He certainly leaves behind the proud legacy of a magnificent edifice of scientific and technologies achievement, technological achievement, and attain, attainments particularly towards the country's energy and national security. So these are some of the comments that have been made about Dr. Radharamana's contributions in the country. Now, the interesting thing is, I would like to narrate one how small instances make a big difference. How did Dr. Radharamana come into the nuclear field? This is not narrated excepting in one place, that is in his own autobiography, which is called Years of Pilgrimage. It is very interesting. You know, Dr. Rajaramanna started playing on the piano very early in life. And he actually had been, uh, uh, his achievement in this field had come to the notice of the late Mysore Maharaja. And he encouraged him. And he had got a scholarship to go to England to pursue music studies after he had completed his physics MSc in uh, Chennai. It so happened that Dr. Rajaramana one morning was playing on the piano in the Mysore State Guest House early in the morning, around 6.30 or 7 o'clock. Dr. Homi Bhava was staying at that time as a guest of the state upstairs. So every morning he used to listen to some music but that day he found uh, somebody was playing on the piano. He came down. And that is when Dr. Ramana met uh, Bhava. And Bhava got interested and asked, asked him, what do you want to do, young man, in the future? Then he told him, I have done physics MSc, but in nuclear physics, but I am going to England to pursue my music. Then Dr. Ramana advised him 
do you can do music but i would like you to continue your studies in uh, uh, physics also so i will arrange for a scholarship for you you go on that in fact he got a tata scholarship uh, to go to england and pursue his studies in atomic energy and later on as you know he became a very important person perhaps the one person who was most maximum responsible for many of the achievements of the atomic energy department so and later on he came here at the after so many years and dr and mr jadi tata identified the right man to start an institution like this and his contributions to neas have been equally great actually you know it is an entirely new type of institution with entirely new objectives and uh, i can tell you as one who has been associated right from the almost from the beginning of uh, this institution it is growing from strength to strength and is being felt as an important institution in the country today so with these few words i now request um, padmanabhan to give his talk before that i would like to say a few words about padmanabhan himself i have known him as the director of the indian institute of science and uh, his field is actually molecular biology and he is a specialist in uh, dealing with drugs for malaria which is a very important uh, piece of work which he has done the drug resistance and many other aspects of uh, he has got the, all the awards of the various academies and he is a padma bhushan so all those uh, things i don't have to repeat everybody knows them and um, he is going to talk today about uh, a very interesting topic and a very relevant one particularly for this uh, school on uh, uh, science technology and health dr patna thank you professor shikantan for the introduction also want to thank dr baldev raj for inviting me to give this dr raja ramanna memorial lecture mrs ramanna family and dear colleagues it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be giving this lecture here dr ramanna was the chairman of our council of the indian institute of science when i was director between 1994 and 1998 it used to be a very lively council meeting with professor Ra raja ramanna in the chair he had a great sense of humor all the time you know and one never felt um, it's a very important meeting you know he should you would just sail through many important items without with his own elan and uh, cutting some joke or the other here and there we also had a connection through music i had learned carnatic music for 15 years so whenever he has some issue with uh, music debates he will drag me to what is your opinion from carnatic side he will say uh, a great individual intellectual and uh, we all respect his contributions appreciate his contributions the topic i have chosen is science technology and health it was given to me actually by dr baldev raj uh, before i go into the science and technology part i thought i should go through the some of the broader issues of health in the country uh, if you look at uh, developed countries uh, you know insurance for example in health becomes a very big issue election issue and so on obama's health care programs and so on that is because the state is supporting most of the health programs there they are worried about their out of pocket expenses they call it increasing while bulk of their uh, support comes from social security of course their concerns are overuse of medical services as we all know whenever we go abroad the one thing we pray is never to fall sick you know if, if you are in a short term there you had it <laughs> you know how to get your health done there it's extraordinarily difficult if a headache can go through so many <laughs> tests which you don't need over prescription of drugs changing demographics such as population aging chronic diseases these are the concerns of developed countries when you come to a country like india 
Everything is out of pocket expense. There is very little of state support. 70%, for example, the statistics say 69% of all the thing comes from our own, ex from the pocket. So bulk, the, the state covers few segments of the society. Bulk of the society is not under the state care. Our problems are also exploitation of the system, spurious drugs, self-medication, fake therapies, especially in the rural and unorganized sector, who do not have any access to modern medicine. At the same time, India also wants uh, face challenges. It wants improved use of essential medicines, expand immunization. We have the universal immunization program in the country. We want to modernize our public hospitals. We want to control tobacco use and so on. So that Medicare becomes accessible and affordable. But on the one hand, we will promote medical tourism, five-star treatment for people who want to undergo medical examinations or surgeries in our country from abroad. But human resources lacking. Look at, we have 0.7 doctors per thousand concentrated in urban areas mostly. In terms of hospital beds, we have one in 1,050, we have one hospital bed. Japan has one in 85. At the same time, what is the opportunity for India in terms of science, in terms of technology? India is a great country in generics, drug in terms of generics. That means drugs which are out of patent. India can make at one third the cost, one fourth the cost. We are leaders now in generic drugs. And slowly even United States opening up to generic drugs because they are finding branded drugs expensive. So generic drugs are accessible. Europe has already accepted generic drugs. Therefore, there's a tremendous opportunity for India to export drugs. I will go to the science and technology part, what is happening in India. We often underestimate what is happening in this, in, in this country. Tremendous amount of science is happening in the health sector in the country. But these all come with cost. Our biggest challenge is not to develop uh, exciting science-based technology, to make it affordable. That is our biggest challenge. So with this introduction, let me come to the innovation and disruption in technologies that are taking place today. I don't want to read from biogenerics to gene therapy to stem cell therapy to synthetic biology. Many things are happening. I will briefly go through many of these items. Let me start with vaccines and biogenerics. You know, vaccine is, in, in human evolution, uh, <laughs> Vaccine is one approach which has saved millions and millions of lives ever since Jenner discovered the cowpox vaccine, actually. And India has done reasonably well in vaccine field. Historically, if you look, we, have, we had Pasteur Institute in Kunur, King Institute in Gindi, which is now Chennai, Hafkin Institute in Mumbai, Central Research Institute in Kasoli, Hindustan Antibiotics, Bengal Immunity in Kolkata, and more recently, BIPCOL in Bulanshir, UP. All were meant to make vaccines, one way or the other. But over a period of time, these public sector units have fallen into some kind of problems, always, you know, they have, some of them have been restructured. But what has happened is the private sector has come in a very big way for vaccine and biogenetic manufacture. Serum Institute, Shanta Biotech, Bharat Biotech, Indian Immunologicals, Biocon right in Bangalore, Reddy Labs, MCure, Pune, I'm, these are just few examples. So what is the net result of this? Now, India makes bacterial vaccines, whether it is uh, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, BCG, cholera, viral vaccines, polysaccharide vaccines, recombinant vaccine, the only recombinant, uh, recombinant means genetically engineered vaccine. This vaccine is, uh, you know, uh, hepatitis B virus has an antigen which is now cloned into yeast and the yeast makes that anti uh, antigen and that becomes a vaccine, genetically engineered vaccine. I'm happy to say we were part of this effort. Shanta Biotech in Hyderabad made, in Bangalore we made at this institute. 
transport companies successfully running today. Combination vaccines, combination of many of these vaccines. So India is exporting vaccines to 150 countries. This is not realized by many people. At the same time, what are the challenges? Our challenges are how many vaccines to give from the childhood to the adolescent. It is estimated you, you need something like 12 or 14 vaccines. On an average, if you have three times, somebody has to be pricked. Now it comes to 36 times, somebody has to be pricked. And it becomes extraordinarily difficult. Therefore, people think of combination vaccines. Can you combine these? Pentavalent vaccine, hexavalent vaccine, and so on. But you cannot arbitrarily combine uh, vaccines. These are all proteins in nature. They will precipitate if you add indiscriminate way. Therefore, there are a lot of research has to go on to make combination vaccines. And the biggest problem in our country is cold chain. Vaccines most often are proteins and they have to be stored at 4 degrees or 8 degrees. And many times it becomes impossible in a rural setting to have this temperature. Cold, to maintain cold chain becomes a huge issue. Therefore, there's a lot of research uh, which says, can you have a vaccine which is stable at room temperature, which is stable at 40 degrees? Success has been achieved. Of course, some technologies are obtained from abroad. Carbohydrate vaccines are very difficult to make. Typhoid, for example. Protein vaccines are easy to make. Carbohydrate vaccines are difficult. We need HPV, flu vaccines, pneumococcal vaccine. These are all respiratory in nature. Other biggest challenge is to delivery of these vaccines. As I told you, can you have a needless delivery? That has become an exciting topic for investigation. Oral administration, nasal administration, through a dermal patch, can you, can you introduce a vaccine? So these are some of the issues uh, that are cha challenges in terms of science, in terms of research. Um, of, at the same time, you will see every year after year you have problem of uh, Japanese encephalitis or dengue or chikungunya. Uh, we still do not have a proper vaccine. We import sometimes vaccine from China and it doesn't really work. There are many other issues which are not science-based. I do not want to get into that. But I must tell you that a lot of effort is going on by the scientific community to develop these vaccines as well. Now I come to biogenerics or biopharmaceuticals. Now what is the difference between biogenerics and generics? Generics refers to drugs, small molecule drugs which we know of. And as I told you, when many of these drugs, branded drugs become out of patent, are getting to be out of patent, our companies take up the synthesis of these molecules. And we have an excellent breed of organic chemists in the country, even now. And you see, they can make these molecules much cheaper. And that's how we compete internationally, uh, what we call as generic drugs. Biogenerics means these are all biological molecules. These are often macromolecules. These are proteins in nature. These are nucleic acids in nature. Insulin is an example. Insulin is a protein. It's not a small organic molecule. You have a whole lot of uh, proteins in our body erythropoietin, uh, uh, GCS of serum albumin, streptokinase, interferon used in cancer therapy, monoclonal antibodies of different types to treat variety of cancers and so on. These are all coming under the category of biopharmaceuticals and one can make at least more than 100 plus biogeneric molecules. India makes around 40 therapeutic products today. Many of our private companies are making them, but our people, this marketing strategy takes over, in my opinion, sometimes the science. They're all into branding. 40 therapeutic products with 350 brands. 40 brands of insulin. It's the same thing, repack, give some other name. Of course, marketing strategies, I suppose. There's nothing wrong in that. I only think we should put a lot of our effort to reach that 100 plus uh, bio, uh, biogenetic molecules because India has a great opportunity to, to, to go into this in the global area, arena. Now I come to drug discovery. I hope I'm not confused. Drug means, I, by definition, I mean small molecule, organic molecules. That has become extraordinarily expensive. Drug discovery, drug development has become extraordinarily expensive. One drug now costs, they say a billion, minimum a billion dollar is required to bring one drug into the market. Therefore, you will see in the last decade, 
All the molecules that have come into the play are biological molecules. If you really look at the literature and all those statistics, very few drugs, new drugs, come into the market because of expenditure, of uh, huge expenditure. Therefore, India's chance, in my opinion, at success to, uh, in the drug discovery and development is very small. We cannot afford it because I, I chair some of the technical committees, which I will come to later, uh, supporting industry to develop a variety of products. They will all develop interesting idea, a drug a target is discovered, a molecule is developed, but they are all looking only to license this molecule at an appropriate time. They want to establish the proof of principle and give it away. They, they, it's just not possible uh, to take it all the way to phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. But we have a greater opportunity to reposition known or failed drugs. This is called as repurposing drugs. Let me explain. There are a large number of molecules which have gone through all the trials very successfully. At some point of time did not make the grade for a particular ailment. It could be economic reasons, it could be some side effects for that particular disease, but the safety profile etc. have already been done. Therefore, what is happening, these are, people are now looking at those molecules, can they be used for some other application? This is known as the repurposing. And it becomes much cheaper because a lot of the trials have been done already. And if you can, I just gave you one example, Galenobax is actually a cardiac drug, which is some company is developing for diabetic foot ulcer successfully. There are many other examples where by which a known failed drug can be repurposed for another application. I also feel we have great opportunity with herbals and natural products. India is traditional, you know, from uh, Vedic literature onwards, Charaka, Shishruta. So many herbals have been discussed. Probably you may not be able to read. I just gave few examples of the Sanskrit name, the botanical name activity. Uh, you name the disease, we have a herbal product there. Similarly, you have natural molecules, that is herbal. That means these are extracts from the plant prepared in a particular way and uh, you know in Ayurveda as you know it has to go through a certain processing and you have to strictly follow those guidelines. But these are molecules isolated from nature. Curcumin, I work on curcumin in its application for example in malaria for example. We have found tremendous effect of curcumin to treat malaria as an adjunct drug. It has the ability to prevent drug resistance development. You know and drug resistance has become a huge issue globally today. I am now pushing beyond malaria whether curcumin can be used in combination with many other drugs to bring down resistance development for the primary drug. In cancer therapy, for example, drug de resistance development is a huge issue. If you combine it with curcumin, it seems you can decrease the dose of the primary drug. Like that, there are many other molecules listed for this, but the bottom line is we have not taken any of this molecule as a globally recognized therapeutic option. This is something, you know, we keep saying our Vedas are great, so much is described. The herbals, many of them are fake. We do not know the, the, the quality of the herbals which we are taking. There are thousands of companies and I told you the poor people, unorganized sector, they are all taking many of these which are not standardized, rationalized. So what we need in this country is to take some of the herbals, which is happening, I must tell you, go through proper clinical trials. And I had great difficulty arguing with Ayurvedic physicians. Sir, why do you need all this? I have treated, I am treating people. I have got certificates. That doesn't help international science. If you have to prove, in China has successfully done it, Chinese molecules, uh, such similar preparations are sold as drugs in the Western world. Ours is sold as a nutraceutical, over the counter, not as drugs. That is because they want clinical evidence that these are working, whether it is diabetes, whether it is arthritis. We have probably very good preparations to treat autoimmune diseases. But we have not done careful clinical clinical evaluation has to be done. We have to go through phase two, phase three clinical trials and that I think is very, very important in my opinion. But we have a chance there. 
rather than going for discovering new classical drugs, which is expensive, perhaps repurposing failed, so-called failed drugs and concentrating on natural products, probably we have a chance. I now come on to innovation in terms of diagnostics, medical instrumentation, mobile health, wearable technologies. I'll briefly explain what these are. India is doing very well. Many, many diagnostic uh, methods have been developed. The principle has been the following. For example, let me take an infectious disease. I work on malaria. If I want to detect malaria in blood, the malaria parasite has its own unique proteins. Antigens, we call it. Can you identify this protein? If you have an antibody for this protein, you can detect it. And there are methods of amplifying it through fluorescence, etc., etc. This is known as ELISA. Fluorescence readers are made. And this is also applicable to cancer. When you have a cancer, there is also a specific protein antigen which is unique to the cancer cell. And can you detect it? This is at the protein level. You can also do it at the DNA level. If the parasite has a DNA, nucleic acid, which is different from the human, can you detect the DNA? And, you know, this is known as the polymerase chain reaction, PCR as we call it, for which someone got a Nobel Prize. You can amplify the DNA in the blood and then identify. If that DNA is present, I know it is malaria. Today, the technology is such, one bacterium, one parasite in blood can be identified. Very powerful technologies are available, and I must tell you, India is making them. There are companies which, have, which are making them. We have, for example, DNA based such a, we have a fever chip, we have eye chip, we have a sepsis chip, we have a cancer chip. These are some of the examples, I'll come back to it later. <coughs> of course, we, we are now improving on these diagnostic, diagnostic methodologies. I told you a protein can be identified using a particular antibody. Can you amplify this signal? One finds if you use a nanoparticle-based systems there, the sensitivity becomes enormously increased. Therefore, the nanoscience is being applied in a very big way in diagnostic field today. I want to read out some of the uh, instrumentation devices that are being developed in India. For example, the design and development of photodynamic therapy laser system, image-guided interventional procedures with emphasis on oncology and pain care to be used by radiologists around the world for biopsy, drug delivery, ablation, drainage, and fine needle aspiration. This is non-invasive ablation technology. A few more examples, there are many, many. I want to just still read about 10, 15 of them. Self-expanding percutaneous aortic valve technology. Novel microfluidics-based flow analyzer. Affordable fluorescence reader for point-of-care diagnostics. High-fidelity affordable mannequin for effective um, cardiac pulmonary resuscitation. Digital oncopath oncopathology slide scanner. Cardiac markers using microcantilever technology. Retinal imaging device for retinopathy of prematurity, automated portable epilepsy EEG system, flat panel computer tomography system, imaging device for monitoring breast tissue changes, wearable transducerless maternal fetal monitoring device, mobile continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. You know, uh, I can give many, many examples. That's this one. Uh, one company, a small company is trying to develop a mobile peritoneal dialysis uh, system and claims it should be possible for someone to carry like a backpack and undergo dialysis as he is working in the office or he or she is working in the office. You know, these are all uh, looks like doable and people are trying fiber laser for photo selective tissue ablation. A novel device for screening newborns for hearing loss in resource poor setting. I just gave you, there are many more examples. Somehow I find now, there's a tremendous, in, biology has become more serious for biologists. It is all the contribution of engineers and physicists, electronic engineers who are coming into this field in a big way actually. Because they are seeing great an opportunity. Biology comes only when it comes to validation. Many of these people know how to make the device, but they don't know what is needed to make it applicable in the field. 
you need a clinician you need a trial you need some biochemical parameters to be assessed before you say your device is fine but uh, because i chair these committees when i see these people coming up with this projects one is very very happy to see many of these instrumentation devices are being developed right in this country how well they will do in the, these are all four five year old story i'm telling you so it is going to take time for them to compete with international devices uh, but uh, let's see where we go then the other thing that is great revolution happening is mobile health health at your doorstep that is where telemedicine is become a great uh, opportunity for india especially in the rural sector where we know it's impossible to help to set up a health center uh, in villages impossible uh, the geography everything becomes an issue therefore it is is it possible to have a group of villages and then have a center where analysis can be done and data transmitted through mobile phone mobile phone is becoming a great instrument for you now tra traversing all the medical information today uh, telemedicine is a fast uh, emerging sector in india several major hospitals have adopted telemedicine devices i mean numbers are given how much and all that just give you two examples mobile phone platform for blood glucose analysis india being a capital of diabetes now glucose analysis in the population becomes very important a uh, simple tests are available you know there are enzyme based analysis available but a software platform mobile phone into a diabetes monitoring platform enabling lay users like health workers and patients to analyze blood glucose test strips using phone's camera track symptoms and lifestyle data and transmit data to your physician for follow up this is going a big uh, i mean evaluation is undergoing similarly you have another example rural primary care diagnostic device as i told you in this center all types of analysis are done you know with the help of the device a range of core tests will be addressed glucose hemoglobin differential blood counts urinary tract infection malaria tb all these can be diagnosed and information transmitted through cell phone etc to someone else sitting somewhere else i just gave you a couple of examples this is from iit mumbai they have developed uh, for example what they called as u check a mobile based urine and blood glucose analysis system launched in 2013 the, another one is uh, much better than just conventional glucometer then i come to wearable technologies today what is happening is you know you wear a belt you wear a band which will remind you when you should take the drug In, of course that is for probably developed countries help them track their moods to work more smoothly together and transmit data to doctor, doctors and so on wearable sweat sensor paves way for real time analysis of body chemistry there are examples in india where people are doing it for example wearable belt to monitor fetal health the pregnant lady wears this belt and the fetal you know eeg and uh, heart beat rates are all measured and transmitted continuous monitoring of ecg environment sensor for ast asthmatics right in bangalore one, one one couple came to me and said we have developed this mobile kind of system which will tell me when the sulfur dioxide carbon dioxide concentration is exceeding a limit and i will get a signal so i won't drive the car to that area that means you know uh, he is an asthmatic Uh, this is again another example from iit mumbai wearable drug delivery you know this is on micro needles they wear the band like a watch and they you know you press the button it will inject micro needles will inject the drug maybe you can use it for insulin you know whenever you want uh, the next example is 3d printing additive manufacturing you know i am not an expert in this area so i because i have to listen to companies presenting all this i have to learn a little bit about what this mean this is you know uh, looking at a 3d global uh, 3d object through uh, digital file and you can construct the whole thing layer by layer by design 
and it had many other metal metallurgy applications. But in health now, people are looking at, can you create an organ using this 3D approach? Right in, right in our institute, uh, very, very funny, or not very interesting collaboration between a biophysicist, an aerospace engineer, <laughs> somebody else, and they have come, they have come up with uh, liver tissue. They can make liver tissue in the test tube. So they have a platform where they have liver tissue. Of course, I still, uh, press is giving a lot of publicity, but still has to undergo. But the point is, what is the use of making a liver tissue? Of course, they will exaggerate saying you can make your organ and then it will, uh, will be used for organ replacement. That's far off. But even as of today, in drug development, toxicity is a big issue. And you go through what we call as phase one or preclinical trial to measure the toxicity of your drug. And the liver is the major site for metabolizing the drug. So if you can you do it in a test tube or a platform as they call it, uh, using the liver, real liver tissue, can you screen for, uh, for drugs, toxicity? It has a lot of screening of drugs using the liver tissue. The other thing that has come up is artificial intelligence. You know, where I understand it is uh, kind of whether the machine can mimic the human mind kind of thing, you know. This is uh, communicating with each other and can you develop. And these smart metric devices are coming in a big way in India today, research level at this level. The art another example is big data analytics. Because of our power in computation, huge amount of data can be analyzed. Today, one is looking at them for DNA analysis. You know, for the example, the genome DNA analysis requires a huge amount of data, huge amount of power. Uh, you know, the three billion base pairs, and uh, to analyze them, you need uh, big computers, etc. Whether they are big data analysis. At the same time, it has tremendous application for public health. For example, India has universal immunization program. A vaccine is given. How many people have taken the vaccine? How many have responded? What is the follow-up? Similarly, therapy, diabetics. How well are they doing? Glucose analysis is done, hemoglobin analysis, glycated hemoglobin analysis is done. Millions and millions of people are involved. Is there any follow-up? Drugs are given, metformin is given, how many people are responding, how many people are not responding. That is where you need big data analysis. We need computation systems for public health purposes in a big way in this country, Be even beyond DNA analysis, which is used in the laboratory. Therefore, it is a tremendous opportunity. So this is what, uh, there is tremendous scope to couple it with the systems biology approach, I will come to it. Needs to be coupled to public health information, personalized medicine. The whole field is moving towards personalized medicine, you know, they, whether they can design something specifically for you. Which in my, conceptually, Ayurveda also tells you. It, is, it treats the individual, not the disease. Now I come to, this is the technology that is being developed in India today with various funding from various agencies, which I'll come to it. If you look at CSIR, which has a new millennium initiative, or a CSIR tech, as they call it, the Department of Science and Technology has a technology development board. We have the Indian Council of Medical Research. The Department of Biotechnology has come to BIRAC, which I'm going to expand a little more. DRDO has a life science research board. Dr. Kalam dragged me into LSRB. I chaired the uh, LSRB for the first five years. Then Department of Atomic Energy has BRNS system for supporting many, many projects in life sciences. The net result of this is what you see here. Somehow we get the feeling nothing has happened in this country. It's, uh, you know, uh, I only want to plead scientists have contributed significantly in the area of health in the area of agriculture, even more. I'm not going to talk about agriculture, but significant contributions have been made. Let me take uh, BIRAC as a, an example. Biotechnology Industry Research Assistance Council, BIRAC. 
This is a section 25 now called as a section 8 company, not profit company, of the Department of Biotechnology. It is the first example of a government having a, a section 8 company, which is essentially funding uh, projects, projects in industry related to health, of course in biotechnology, which ranges from health, agriculture, environment, everything under the sun. And you have huge number of programs here. You have Ignition Grant, Small Business Innovative Research Initiative, Contract Research, Biotechnology Industry Partnership Program. There are channels available through which uh, one can graduate from one to other and then see whether a product can reach the market. This is just some statistics for you. Uh, the only con consideration here is the Ignition Grant is for youngsters. It can be a PhD, need not, who need not be a PhD, somebody has a bright idea. But it should be industry oriented, should have uh, access to an industry. And it can be an individual, and if the project is good, they are supported up to 50 lakhs, 18 months time. The proof of principle must be established within this time. And if it is successful, then you know, you go to Sibri, the, the whole channel I showed you, they can take it further. And it, it is, uh, it's gone for the last nine years, but Bayrak itself came into being only in the last four years. But I believe at least about 34 products have been developed. 100 and 104 100 academic institutions have been supported. 240 startups and entrepreneurs have been supported. And other than the ignition grant, where somebody gets a grant, all others, the industry has to contribute 50%. 50 percent, the government gives 50 percent, the industry has to contribute. And uh, something like um, 654 projects have been supported uh, so far, and some 830 beneficiaries in this. A very large number of industries has created a lot of excitement in the biotech industry today. And these are some of the examples of all the products that have been developed, which I read earlier, some of them for you. And because of BIRAC success, the government is looking, why not have a BIRAC-like system with other agencies also? You know, whether it's a chemicals and fertilizers, you know, can we have a BIRAC system? Whether it is possible to have a BIRAC similar, that is support the industry, let the industry also contribute, is it possible? But it's a very strict uh, evaluation process, you know, there is a shortlisting, site visit, presentations, etc., etc. And because of that, many international agencies are coming to interact with the BIRAC Welcome Trust, Sefibra uh, um, from France, and you know, USAID. I have given the list of international agencies which are collaborating now with BIRAC, in addition to the internal collaboration with DST, ICMR, and so on. Well, this is what so far we are present picture now. But science is not stagnant. You know, you can see what is happening internationally. You know, this the Alice in Wonderland, you will remember, I have to write, I have to run that much faster to stay where I am. This is a position in India. Things move so fast elsewhere. I just give you two, three examples. Synthetic biology. <laughs> what is synthetic biology? And this whole field was developed not by biologists. It was developed by engineers and physicists towards the late uh, 1990s. All that they want is, if a machine can run, run, can you make a machine out of a cell? Can you make a machine out of a living cell? That was their uh, ambition. And to put it in a simpler language, a machine runs with wire transistors, valves, diodes, relays, electronic switches, and so on. But in synthetic biology, you will have genes, RNA, proteins, manipulate, transcription, translation. These are the ones replacing those valves and wires in the system. Uh, I will not get into great detail. All that it, it tells you is, just like uh, electronic circuit, you can make a circuit using transcription. You can use repressors, inducers, activators, feedback systems. All are possible and you can get an output there. The output can be of different types. 
and this is the under, uh, underlining principle that is involved and there are very complicated circuits can be developed and what kind of outputs you can get but what has happened is this whole process of uh, engineering cell with genes from outside you can change the complexion of the cell itself living cell itself which means now the cell can now make products which you have never visualized before in your life totally new products you know our body cell whether it is a plant cell animal cell bacterial cell they all make products huge enough for their own living you can you can manipulate these pathways using this kind of technology and uh, you can totally change the product profile and this is not utopian this is not a dream you can i just want to uh, project at the side the defense advanced research project agency living foundries program in united states is working with many companies national laboratories and universities to develop new tools to enable rapid engineering of biology it is tackling impossible today that should become possible tomorrow and they have what is called as a thousand molecule project seeks nothing short of a fundamental disruption of traditional chemicals and materials industries and processes by developing thousand new chemical building blocks for entirely new materials at the molecular scale and nano scale in the next 3 to 5 years synthetic biology will replace conventional chemical factories by cell factories it is the new revolution as important as microelectronics or nanotechnology this is what is happening and this is what internationally if you see this is a cartoon which says all the companies that are involved in this field dupont or cargill or pfizer or any of these companies and this gives you uh, the products which they are contemplating various companies are contemplating which ranges from home and personal care products flavors paints cosmetics adhesives you name them many chemical somebody is planning to make them using synthetic biology our synthetic biology projects are at the level of capacity building we have just initiated therefore in, in all my life i have felt we are 10 years behind in any field for example and i feel they will continue because the synthetic biology is going at a tremendous pace there and it needs a lot of support you know, and we need uh, uh, but i believe we should concentrate on microbial systems because in microbial systems if you can manipulate you can make any product you want and it can be grown in a confined system you can have a fermenter and make whatever you want actually and we have a great opportunity there but i we are we are far away from any exploitation the field is just beginning in this in, in our country then we have this field called systems biology systems biology let me give you this uh, cancer cell network you know uh, we all work on many people say we are working on cancer uh, if you look at this network of a uh, cancer cell is extraordinarily complex and we work in one corner and then say we are working on cancer we understand cancer that means it is a kind of a spoken wheel model you know every uh, metabolite in the cell is interacting with 100 other components in the cell how do you analyze that you know i have been, i used to teach uh, phd students msc students glycolysis glucose glucose phosphate etc etc i will go to linear a to b b to c c to d and so on now now one finds the enzyme which makes a to b is linked to 100 other components actually now how do you analyze this which is functional at what point of time you need systems biology it's all mathematics anymore you know it's it's too much for biologists to handle these this kind of project but it has come in a very big way of great help a complex disease like diabetes at least 300 genes are involved in diabetes 300 genes minimally how do you analyze their contribution that is where systems biology is coming in a big way the next field is gene therapy gene therapy is what we have all genetic disorders whether it is thalassemia hemophilia the principle is can you replace a defective gene by a normal gene from outside 
It is possible because the gene can be synthesized in the laboratory today. Whether it's hemoglobin, we can make it. If the mutation is there, the, you can replace that gene with a normal gene. And this is a, this is a field which went uh, one step forward and two step backwards, all last 25 to 30 years. One problem or the other. We cannot make as much as the protein that the body makes. But people find, even if you make 10% of that, it gives a lot of relief. And how do you introduce the gene from outside? You have to use a vector. It's, sometimes it's a viral vector. In their anxiety to push a lot of DNA, somebody used a lot of this viral vector, which is only a carrier, and the patient died of the virus, not, not of the therapy. Immediately there was a furore, and people said you should go to the back, black uh, drawing board, and again, you know, went back. Like that is going back and forth. But it's a tremendous conceptually. More recently, things have started working, especially in the eye. You know, retinal diseases, people have been hereditary, labor, congenital amaurosis who become blind. We know the gene that is defective. The, you know, people have been able to treat it. Hemophilia is another problem. These people cannot, the blood will not clot. Thalassemia, cancer, some of the cancers, even Parkinson's disease, people are now trying to see. Therefore, this is now becoming a reality. After 30, 35 years of back and forth, you now see uh, the tunnel. That is where I sometimes feel in our anxiety to become uh, application oriented. People are very restless, people are impatient. Some of these fields need the time, need the experience, but are we ready to have that patience? That is, uh, I do not know. Then, probably the last example, stem cell therapy. There's a huge excitement about stem cell therapy. A stem cell is a primordial cell that can give rise to all other types of cells in the body. That is the simplest principle. Therefore, especially aging, when your neurons are, uh, are lost or something, stem cell can be differentiated into neurons. Stem cells can be differentiated to muscle cells for muscular dystrophy. But theoretically, the concept is great. But, but I'm not sure it has really worked in the clinic so far, except a few examples. Bone marrow transplantation to treat leukemia is a very old accepted therapy. Many of the blood borne disorders, yes, stem cell replacement is possible. But there are a lot of claims we can cure spinal injury, we can cure arthritis. Many of these are open, still open to question. They are not in the clinic at this point of time. But at the same time, there are scrupulous or unscrupulous advertisements. We can cure this, we can cure that. And people who have exhausted all other options do accept these therapies. But one has to be very, very careful. It is not, for example, in the, in the uh, Europe, they have approved it only for one application. That's what I told you in the eye the therapy. And uh, at the same time, you see, I'll come to it later, maybe. So, while there is a lot of opportunity, I feel that people are also being taken for a ride. Uh, that stem cell therapy can cure everything. You know, that is something. The hardcore evidence is lacking that it has worked. <clears throat> then this new thing is coming of gene editing. That means existing gene can be edited, can be changed. And there is a system called CRISPR-Cas. I'm not getting into the mechanics of how it does. A mutation, because of that somebody is suffering from thalassemia. Can you use this CRISPR-Cas technology to correct that mutation? It is possible. China has already gone, for example, China has launched the first ever CRISPR gene editing trial in humans, November 15, 2016, to treat lung cancer patients. Because in China, I believe, you know, you can get many things done, uh, which is not possible in India. Well, so, I was telling you about vaccine and repurposing drugs and natural products, diagnostics, medical devices. Then move on to the challenges, what is happening, whether it is synthetic biology, systems biology, 
or uh, gene editing or stem cell therapy. At the same time, we have down to earth challenges. We have an agreement by Rack and Melinda Gates Foundation, reinvent the toilet challenge. We have a huge problem there. So it's not as if you know you are flying uh, with all these uh, big, big words. Where is on the ground? Where is the sanitation? But when we put it for advertisement, you know, put it, uh, I was surprised to see so many projects coming up. Field test a solar-powered modular electronic toilet that is integrated with a mixed waste processing unit. Use of viral agents to kill pathogens and odor-producing bacteria and fecal waste. Viability of using ultrasound to reduce water used in toilets. A single household container that uses human feces to incubate black soldier fly larvae, which can be processed into marketable product. Concept of using fine sand-like material and an air blower to create a water-free toilet interface free of odor and flies. Design a septic tank that uses electrochemistry to reduce organic pollutants and improve the quality of discharge. You provide the challenge, there are people who come up with solutions. Not that everything is going to work, but you know, I think there is a lot of wealth, human wealth here in this country. But quickly on to, I'll take, I should take five minutes and finish. Regulatory embargo. We have a huge problem with the regulatory issues in this country. Our Drug Controller General Office uh, has been a huge problem. Of course, they are, they are changing quite a bit, but uh, we still do not know. For example, we have only DBT ICMR guideline for stem cell therapy. Guideline doesn't mean uh, it can be applied. You know. It's not only a guideline. It's not a law. So stem cell therapy, they will advertise, they will say they will cure a spinal injury and then try all, all kinds of things, actually. Okay, this is one thing, but synthetic biology. I told you about the virtues of synthetic biology, but there's a huge ethical concern there. People are asking, are scientists trying to play God? What if these modified organisms escape the environment and go create havoc? So there are no, there is international guideline, there is international regulation, ethics. We are far away from even thinking about those ethics at this point of time. We are still concerned about drug trial, how to approach, how to sanction a drug trial. Devices, people with devices, we, they just need a clinical trial. They did not know where to go. Drug controller said it is not in my purview. Only recently, after a lot of pressure, they have formed a separate committee to look at uh, medical devices. So, Long way to go to keep pace with advancements. In the meanwhile, we have cyber security issue. In big data analytics of individual, because that is where you have personalized medicine coming, and cyber security becomes a huge issue. Private, private knowledge. Well, the biggest advantage that is going on is, you know, is the startup. All this innovation, you know, it's not for, you know, people. We start from experience. The innovative thinking comes from the youngest of the minds. Therefore, there is a startup culture which has caught on in this country in a big way, uh, which is very, at least in biotechnology, I know. It's a huge. The Ignition grant about 200 within a short period, 200 projects. I'm happy to say, you know, in the startup culture, uh, Bangalore uh, figures in the global ranking. We are proud of it, but we are very seriously trying to destroy the city. <laughs> But I think the role, academia has a role in, uh, in developing startups, mentoring startups. Every institution I have been pleading, every institution in the country, research institutions, CSAR, 40 institutions, or 38 institutions, ICMR, DBT, many, many institutions are available. Each institution can support easily a dozen startup. That is the way to go about it, in my opinion. And all, all the technology that is being developed in that government institution, the startups can co-develop. They are prepared to spend time and energy. They need some help. They need some investment, which the government is prepared to give. We are planning to have 2,000 startups. We already have 500 startups. But you see the way China thinks. The Chinese minister says, would establish in 150 universities, 1,600 incubators, and support 80,000 startups. The way they think itself is different, I feel. Their thinking process itself is very different from what we can plan. Maybe they are, I don't know. Well, these are all the strategies which one thinks about supporting the startup system. Create, uh, you need the enabler, you need support factors, you need help. 
But our problem quickly, many of these youngsters, young companies, medium companies who have reached a stage, we don't have pilot plant facility in, this, in the country in a big way. Where do they test large scale production? Manufacturing units are not there in this country. I'm talking about biologicals. Government has to guarantee purchase of products of public health. For example, somebody makes, see H1N1 was such a hype was made on that. It's a rare thing that comes. We forced the company to make and made the vaccine. By the time the vaccine was made, there was no H1N1. <laughs> and millions of doses were stuck with the company. And they came to me and said, what do I do with this? Uh, they, next time, they will not make. Why would they make? Therefore, government has a role. It's a public health policy. They have to buy. This is where some of these are. Our lacunae is still critical mass with expertise. We still do not have. Translation in the academic community is catching up. But generally, oh, so long has been published papers. High impact factor journals, many of you would have heard impact factors, dominate our thinking process. Uh, application oriented research, but I, I should say in the last, uh, especially of the new government come, has come, many, many academic institutions are talk, talking about translation. Investment is an issue in this area because in this area, anything you fructify, it takes eight to 10 years. And the investor is not prepared to wait. They want to put it in IT and get the return in two years. No, that doesn't happen in this area. We need innovation. We need regulatory mechanisms. It's still a major government initiative. You know, private industries have to come in a big way. But please don't go with the impression this is all high five. All that is needed is a thinking process. You know, somebody, this guy, who is a college dropout, Mark Koska, developed, I give this example in every one of my lecture. He just found a method by which a lock, the syringe, needless, you know, the reuse syringe, he made a syringe which cannot be reused. Equipped with a locking ring in the bottom of the barrel so that when the plunger is fully depressed, it stays there. Trying to pull the plunger back would snap the ring and effectively break the syringe. And this was considered to be one of the greatest discoveries, actually. If you really think, you will always say, why I didn't think about this? Millions of these needles are being, of course, they have been further modified, but I, it's exciting. This is what he says, you can do it if I have done. So, India is a global leader today in vaccines. We can do the same in biogenerics. Universal immunization and nutritious food for millions of children in midday meal program. That is what is going to transform this country. It is possible. In the service sector, clinical trials and big data analysis. I didn't get into clinical trials. India was a big destination for clinical trials. But you know, this activism that we are being used as guinea pigs, etc., you know, destroyed that actually. We can have a lot of safeguards, agreements, etc., but you know, it's a, it's a, we will benefit by that. And big data analysis, another many, many companies are coming to India for big data analysis because of the strength in IT sector. I feel you have to link biotechnology with the IT and diagnostic service to the rural sector, but newer areas, synthetic biology, systems biology, all this uh, will pose a lot of challenges. The biggest challenge is we have both communicable and non-communicable diseases. We are world leaders, not only in diabetics, we are also leaders in tuberculosis. The largest number of tuberculosis cases occur in India. We have three different generations in this country. There is a mini Europe, there is a rising middle class, we also have the poorest of the poor. Advances in health technologies come with a tag. Who can buy this? We will develop all this. Who will buy? Will it reach the poorest of the poor? It is not only a question of making new discoveries, but how to make them relevant to the society. It is much easier to do research in the laboratory and publish papers. Lab to land transfer is a very different domain with huge challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fadunabhan. It was a very liberating lecture with very lot of practical suggestions. I'm sure the various people here would have questions to ask you. And uh, we'll, uh, if you can come here. Yeah. We'll start from that side. Uh, 
I have two small questions. One question is about a generic drug. It is supposed to be cheaper by almost 50 to 60 percent. If that is so, why government cannot pass a registration, at least for the common diseases, when the patent is not a real issue? Generic drugs only should be sold in the India. That is not being done by the government. First question. Second question is, you said uh, creating a drug in India is an expensive process. In India, it is not possible. But uh, we have seen almost 20 years back itself, Dr. Reddy Labs at Hyderabad has uh, developed drugs because they, they spent so much money on R&D and they have even patented the drugs. If Reddy Labs can do it, why government cannot spend on R&D and do it? I'll take the second question first. You know, all that Reddy Labs did, Kratzim, many of these, they are all biogenerics. They patent the process, not the molecule. You know, you can always patent the process, but the, pro the molecule, that product patent is different from process patent. But it is not to undermine the contribution of Reddy Labs. They have done excellent. That, that is what I said. In biogenerics, there are many, many companies. Biocon right in Bangalore. They have now come up with insulin. The buyer is trying to buy from Biocon insulin molecule. But the, making a new chromo, I mean, pharmacophore, that is what is a new drug discovery. The first question is a policy issue, but I think uh, generic drugs are only sold in most people. Maybe the rich people will, will go for branded drugs or imported drugs. They may have a relative from Germany and then bring the drug. All those are specific examples. But by and large, it's all generic drugs in India. Uh, only thing is we need to be sure of uh, companies' credentials on the quality of the molecule, actually. Yeah. Yeah. national perspective. Uh, sir, uh, if you look at the investment from uh, for research in India, India is seventh uh, you know, funding organization, funding country for research, but not seventh in technology development or uh, deriving any benefit. Next, if you look at the patent, uh, which is prosecuted, in India, 80% of the prosecution is from foreign countries and uh, Indian prosecution is only 20%. Even in that 20% also, workable patents are very few. And uh, as you are from uh, academic organization and uh, as you know, as I understand, you know, there are a lot of patents, you know, IAC, Javanand Aru Institute, you know, prosecuting in foreign countries. This, any, any information, any, can I have some light, whether any of this patent worked in, in, uh, in those countries, because the getting a prosecution for outside country, it takes a lot of expense. So I just want to know, this interest in patenting, uh, taking uh, no patent for the invention made in India by academic organization is, worked in foreign countries. In case if it is not worked, why there is a patent? You know, why unnecessarily the uh, expense is spent just for uh, uh, for a non-workable patent uh, invention? You raised very <coughs> pertinent issues, actually. Government investment is very small. I must tell you, you may say seventh in the thing, but if you can, quantitative terms, the investment by the government is very, very little, uh, for which the scientists have returned considerably, in my opinion, significantly. If the longevity index has changed from 30 years, 32 years, to 63 years today, how it has happened in this country? This has happened because of uh, health systems, which scientists have contributed. Scientists are poor communicators, you know, not that we should co be cocky and then say we have done this, we have done that. But the fact remains is the scientists in the health field and scientists in the field of agriculture have contributed significantly for all the investment which the government has made. In quantitative terms, if you look, uh, it's so small. And I can go on with the complaints which the academics have. Many times the sanction is on paper. 
you don't get their money for two years. Science is not like, you know, if you don't get the money when you, when you have it, there's no point in re releasing it. They will say, oh, end of what is the academic year ends, uh, financial year ends, ends in March 31st. You release the money in December, and you spend the money in three months. What, you know, how do you do this? You, know, you plan ahead, much ahead of time. I'm not complaining, but what I'm trying to tell, what the point you made about patents is very true. However, patterns have hardly uh, made any impact in this. No. But I must tell you, the situation is changing dramatically. It's also a cultural issue. You have talked about the Indianness of science. I remember I, when I was director, industry will come to me and say, I want this from your... Then they say, I want it free. You are a government-supported agency. Why are you demanding money? Why you are... Uh, we have a center for... <laughs> Uh, scientific and industrial consultancy, and they have a process by which they will charge. And these people will argue, you should give it free. This is a government-supported institution. This is meant for us. That has been the attitude, you know, I, and this is true in a way many other, even CSR institutions. The whole of patenting, in my opinion, is only picking up now. And I'm not, as you rightly said, I'm not very sure. I'm. I belong to a slightly different category. I don't believe in patenting things uh, which are of public good, in, especially in a poor country. You know, there is a thing called open source drug discovery, where all people concerned, including industries, will forego all this and contribute knowledge and develop a molecule for public good, and nobody has a right for that. This is known as open source drug discovery. I don't know whether it will practically work, but there is a community, global community, which is looking at it. For example, I have, people say curcumin, I have sown curcumin, and I do have a patent. And what the hell, why did I patent? You know, uh, this is for a poor man's uh, drug uh, treatment, malaria is a poor man's disease. <laughs> Nobody is going to, uh, the companies don't make money out of selling malaria drugs, they will make money by selling cardiac drugs. Therefore, you know, it is, a, it is an issue, but also we go from one end to the other. There's a phase when one director general said, patent, 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 and CSR went all patenting, all uh, useless patents. Uh, people will say, my institution has 100 patents this year. Not a single patent was ever exploited. Then came a period when they said, publish good research, don't worry about patents. Now, again, it is changing now with the new government coming, it should be translation patents. A policy, do we have a steady policy in this country, so far as science is concerned? My thing is, you know, there has to be a recognition of what scientists can do in the health sector, in the agriculture sector. Somehow, I, get, I may be wrong, but I get the feeling this government recognizes space research, space contribution, which is very valid. It should. So it doesn't mean other sectors, nothing has happened. A lot of things have happened. Yeah. Yes, I don't know whether it, uh, this query may be appropriate here. Uh, we, this uh, drug pricing. In Kerala, there are shops, uh, needy shops, which are selling drugs as, uh, as low as 50 percentage of the price of what is sold in other uh, medical shops. For a poor country like India, especially a very vital antibiotics and all, having profit margin to that high, is it appropriate? No. Biggest problem in India, you know, we need to worry about spurious drugs. There are villages in some states who are only involved in manufacturing spurious drugs. So when you, some, when you say somebody is selling at 50 percent, make sure it is it's a good drug. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It, it should be, it should be, if somebody is making prof profit out of it, I do not know how much profit one can make. But definitely, uh, that issue is there of, uh, my concern is spurious drugs, actually. But generic drugs are much cheaper anyway. I do not know which one you are talking about, which any specific example, but uh, generic drugs are much cheaper. But the problem is, even if I say a vaccine is sold at 15 rupees a dose, People say it is expensive. 
So I really do not know. This is where our biggest challenge for scientists and technologists in this country. You develop something, how, how low the price should be to make it affordable? Or the government should buy and give it free? I do not know. There is no landmark. Land, landmark discovery in Indian science, just like you know, Nobel Prize level or. Uh, uh, so I was thinking, and I came something, some sort of a triplet uh, strength or a triplet model, which I like to share with you. When I thought about you know Raman effect and Raman uh, discovery and uh, Nobel Prize for that, what I understood and what I see is a great teacher. Professor Raman, a great discovery Raman effect, a great student, outstanding student, student K.S. Krishna. So I found a triplet model or triplet synergy, I don't know what should I call for that. Then I have been curiously searching for this kind of triplet system in any other thing, wherever, you know, my reading is limited, my affiliation in CPRA, I may be identified as an officer from CPRA, my name is Varghese. So then one more discovery close to Nobel Prize I found, I searched, it is not my subject, but out of my curiosity I searched, and I came across G. and Ramachandran and his peptide effect. Very, I was very happy to see the enthusiasm and the level of quality work and the level of scientific excellence at that time, Linus Pauling, he is attracting Linus Pauling and other Nobel laureate like you know, Madam Dorothy. And there also I found this triplet strength, an outstanding teacher like G. N. Ramachandran, an outstanding discovery which I have, not, I have not come for prepared, I know, I have studied that uh, process of peptide calculation and his chart, uh, which I have studied, because it is not my subject, so out of enthusiasm. So there is an outstanding discovery. There also I found an outstanding student, a triplet strength. Who is the student? G. N. Kartha. Further I am searching, if I look at my neighbor IAC, I am not finding this triplet. If, if I missed, I may be corrected. An outstanding teacher, a great teacher, a great discovery, a great teacher producing a great discovery together with a, an outstanding student. Why is it not happening? Are our teachers are not doing enough to our student? If an, I am also a research guide, I produce PhD students. So this is what I have to ask. I have to share. I am also a PhD student. I sorry, a PhD guide. 23 year, 24th year. I am guiding a, uh, uh, is my guidance. Uh, I have currently also a PhD student. This is what I am asking. Are we doing enough for our country? And these are the two big examples we are learning from. Uh, Ramach uh, Raman effect, you know, from an ordinary university. G N, uh, you know, Ramachandran discovery is also an ordinary university, which whatever. But an institute like IAC, anything like this, why is it not happening? I don't think I need to defend why India is not getting Nobel Prize. The fact remains we have not got. But you know, J. N. Ramachandran did not get Nobel Prize. I hope you know that. Yes, <laughs> no, no, that, you know, J. N. Ramachandran is an outstanding scientist. We are all proud of him. He was in our biophysics, he established our biophysics department here. But in spite of all that, he did not get Nobel Prize. His collagen structure, triple helical structure, uh, which was appreciated internationally, we have what is called the Ramchandran plot, which is used by all the people who do proteomics today. He did not get a Nobel Prize. But you know, not, it's true. I don't think we have done a work which, is, which has not fetched us Nobel Prize. But I don't think that is a yardstick. We will be very poor judgment to make based on Nobel Prize. I tell you, both who, who showed plants of life did not get a Nobel Prize. Day in Calcutta, who discovered cholera toxin, which, which revolutionized the whole cholera understanding of the disease, did not get a Nobel Prize. I can give many such examples of people who have discovered things in India who did not get Nobel Prize. So for heaven's sake, don't use Nobel Prize as a criterion. But I do accept, we have not got Nobel Prize on this. 
it is now totally it's not political it is, you need a tremendous amount of political support also for somebody to be build up the structure you know how people's thing are built up laskar award in us they will say if somebody gets a laskar award he should get a nobel prize and they will build that person to get laskar award not undeserving he deserves all right but do we have that machinery in this country to build the image of a person to a level that nobel committees uh, there are many many example people like day who have contributed uh, in the discovering i said told you if the health longevity index has changed so much it's due to the main contribution many vaccines have been done many maybe not up the nobel prize level how do you judge nobel prize i work with malaria and i wrote an article because i have worked with curcumin and it is as good as artemisinin in for which nobel prize was given last year for a chinese scientist so i wrote saying artemisinin got nobel prize curcumin is still waiting and you know it is a molecule traditional molecule there is no disease in which it has not been tested not found to be active it's active but that is where you need a political will to build up that system to enable uh curcumin should be a universal adjunct drug this is what i am trying articles writing articles etc what i am trying to say is very many important discoveries have been made in this country not only in biology in all other subjects maybe they have not got nobel prize but that cannot judge the quality of science in this country patenting we didn't have a culture of patenting in this country the culture of patenting has come on the last decade or so although i have my own doubts whether it is worth patenting you know patenting patenting for what what are we patenting for especially public health diseases poor people should be affected why should we be patenting and make them pay more you have partly you have right thinking partly i don't agree with your analysis yeah yes please yeah no no questions are already came in one uh, this one policy combination medicines are not manufacturing right. in india now generic medicine uh, recently that impact i want to know uh, the uh, earlier combination medicine in a, uh, getting it's a, a good for carrying and using the common man now a number of tablets must be as a this one that can be a more problem and more illness about that kind of issue who will address no i think I, i tell you even who is preferring combination therapy for the simple reason you there is a principle resistance development for a mono therapy is much greater than when you use a combination the second drug somehow also acts on the same disease but at a different site therefore the efficacy of therapy increases and the rate at which resistance develops to the primary drug is slowed down that has been the i know the classical physicians will say you should have only one drug ranthi you know that concept has changed combination therapy has come into existence but you are also right putting for example why do you treat a simple uh, disease uh, simple headache they will give broad spectrum antibiotics in the beginning and that is where you know it's simpler uh, we, we don't diagnose the disease and simply give you a broad spectrum antibiotic now that is that is very dangerous in my opinion in that sense you know we can misuse some of this yeah but there is nothing wrong in combination therapy as such I, I, that's a right point i want to tell yeah talked many things about the drugs and the scientific contribution of india and of course uh, today we, we were discussing about the healthcare in general now one of the key issue which also you highlighted is uh, which i want to ask here maybe it's a digression is about the medical education in india see the one of the challenges countries facing is in that field because as you himself told we don't have even one doctor per thousand persons and that sector is in real mess both in terms of government aided uh, medical schools we have not increased the capacity there are medical schools which have come 
you know, by the, with the aid of uh, private institutions, but the education is so costly that many of the citizens, they really cannot afford it. So why we are not, you know, Niti Aayog or any policy making body is really giving a serious concern because most of our healthcare is suffering because of that issue, not because of, you know, uh, the pricing of the drugs, etc. We are doing fairly well in that. But in, this is the major region, major sector in which really the problems are. Uh, so I, I, I want your comments on that and then how we can go up, uh, forward in this direction. I don't have an answer, but I agree with you, our medical education is in doldrums, actually. There is no doubt about that. Mainly because I feel, you know, colleges are expanding, seats are being expanded. Whether there is a facility there to impart a proper medical education, we do not know. You might have heard of how institutions get sanctioned from the medical council. You know, there are faculty who are hired by different medical institutions and they will appear when the committee is uh, visiting that particular institution. Such practices have been held and there have been problems with our medical council itself, you know, which is supposed to be the regulator for the whole thing actually. You are very right, you know, we are expanding medical colleges without ensuring whether appropriate infrastructure is there in this institution or there are adequate teachers there to impart uh, quality education. And the things I am talking about, really if medical institute, in fact one of the objectives of our uh, bio biotechnology is to involve more and more clinicians in research. You know, they, the stock answer is they are very busy, they have no time for research. This is the stock answer, but it is very unfortunate. In the United States, if you see many of these laboratories in this area are headed by MD, PhDs. They will have both MD and PhD. We, to have MD, PhD itself is a huge issue. Medical Council will not accept. You cannot have all the kind of regulations, rules, they will say. Instead of science tried to have an MD, PhD program in collaboration with a medical institution. Uh, they found it is extraordinarily bureaucratic processes are involved and they gave it up by I don't have an answer how to do that, you know, but uh, I feel uh, on the one hand you have demand for medical, every child today in this country they will say they will they want to become a doctor or an engineer. This is a stock answer you will get, nothing else you will get. So to provide that government will keep on increasing the seats. And of course, they are give permission to start medical colleges also. These are beautiful buildings. I have visited some of them. Inside, you will have a lining, monitors, computers will be there. But you ask them about the subject, practically will nothing will they know. I don't know how do they get permission to start medical colleges like that. So for everything you have, you know, everything is All India Institute of Medical Sciences. It's one of the best institutions, I should tell you, but at the same time, it's overloaded. So much overloaded that, you know, people have to stay outside campuses. It's one of the best places, and the people are research-minded there. I have seen in Delhi, you know, but uh, do we have some institutions in this country? There are some, right in Bangalore, we name Hans is a very good institution, but you can count them in, you know, handful. You don't have many of them. If you restrict, you know, if I say you restrict everything, then what about the aspirations of the people to satisfy? How do you answer this? No. I don't have an answer here. Simple questions. See, whenever a vaccine is given to a child, the doctor says the child may develop fever or may not. Does it mean that if a child develops fever, that molecule is active or else it's not? The other question is, whenever a child is born, a list of compulsory vaccination and an optional vaccination, they give a list, such as this rotavirus, measles and all, they come and are optional. How do we take a decision and how do they categorize it? And how do we as a normal people take a decision whether my child should be administered with an optional vaccine or not? See, the government has what is called as a universal immunization program, in which a set of vaccines are listed. DPT, including hepatitis B, also has been included in that. Now, rotaviral vaccine probably will get into the universal immunization program. Now, that decisions are made depending on the mortality that is happening, the extent to which this disease is prevalent. You know, such of those criteria will go into the making the decision whether, whether a particular vaccine will get into the universal immunization program. 
Rest is all our own judgment, you know, like uh, many of these uh, diarrheal diseases in children. They can be cured by oral rehydration therapy, actually. You don't need a vaccine, actually speaking, many of them. But then, do we care, you know, are there families who know exactly what to do, what to do? So what happens is it would be safe probably to have a vaccination done on those kind of things. It, is, it becomes individual decisions for some of those vaccines. Right? Especially childhood diarrhea, in, in my opinion. It is eminently treatable by rehydration therapy, oral rehydration therapy. If you cannot buy that, they say add a pinch of salt and sugar to water and give it to the child. Uh, that's good enough. So it has to be personal decision made. Sir, I wanted to know your opinion regarding this uh, GM and technology <laughs> and recombinant DNA technology. Because on one hand, our government is promoting a lot of this R&D research and biotechnology. We have a lot of scientists working on that. On the other hand, we are putting uh, fixing the price of the technology, just like in BT cotton is happening. And even one of the biggest companies has threatened to pull out of India. And uh, for our own public sector, we have uh, ready with more than 50 transgenic products to be released. But for for, for past 15 years, there is uh, has been debate only, no concrete decision that we, whether we will release or not. So how it will go? Are you from IARA? No. Pantanagar University. I am a great supporter of GM technology. You know, to the extent that uh, activists blame. This guy is supported by multinationals, you know, that's what they say. I tell you, uh, GM technology is one of the very good technologies. I, I, I can give a separate lecture on agriculture, uh, but the only point I want to make, safety concerns. That is how they say this is. Millions of people, United States, Canada, China, South Africa, Argentina, Brazil, are consuming BT corn for over 15 years now. Over 15 years, forget about all the science, all the technology, this is a field experiment. And billions of cattle have been fed, fed this corn in the last 15 years. Do we think these governments would allow BT corn to be given to their people, to their cattle, if it is environmentally unsafe, if it is unsafe health-wise? just doesn't stand to reason, you know. No government, developed countries, and Argentina, Brazil, they are all giving BT corn for the last 15 years. And we are the only country arguing about safety of BT in particular. Very unfortunate, for example, BT Brinjal, I must tell you. We developed this technology in this country, uh, or uh, what is that, Congress Minister, Jairam Ramesh, put an embargo on BT Brinjal, and that clone has been taken by Bangladesh. And Bangladesh is baking BT Brinjal. And their farmers said, we are very much benefited. And this is now the third season. Commercialized BT Brinjal is going in Bangladesh. And I joke, actually, that Brinjal must have come to Calcutta already. There's no way. You know, if Bangladesh to come to Calcutta, how long it takes? I'm sure Calcutta people are consuming BT Brinjal. And this is what happened to this government in BT cotton also. When BT cotton was first cultivated, there was a huge hue and cry. But what happened, clandestinely BT cotton seeds were obtained by what is that, No Bharat or some such company, and gave it to farmers. Farmers started growing, and they found a huge difference in yield. That is it. The government said, we will take action, nothing can be done. They then they regularized the whole process, actually. The government permission to cultivate BT cotton came after the clandestine crop was grown for two seasons. So it will be very unfortunate. For example, there's a big talk now going on about GM mustard. It will be very unfortunate. You know, as a scientist, uh, you are saying what scientists have done. This is one other example, GM mustard is a very good discovery done by South Campus in Delhi. Dr. Deepak Pentel has developed that. After all, doing tests for nine years, all the regulatory controls, all the regulatory studies. Now the government is the dilly dallying. One minister says we will do it, one minister says we will not do it. God save this country. Yes. 
regarding gene therapy and stem cell therapy, sir, uh, how do you see future of these technologies keeping in view of uh, their past 30 years history and uh, our affordability in India? Because in hospitals, uh, uh, they straight away jump to us asking uh, during fifth month of pregnancy they will come and we would like to store your stem cells and all. Uh, uh, so how, how should we see this? No, right now it's very expensive. See, like, you know, for example, they want to store the cord blood cells as soon as the pregnancy is taking place. This is stem cell, basically, saying you can use it for therapy later on in your life. And for 10 years storage, uh, this is the amount. For 20 years storage, this is the amount. You, you do not know whether it's going to work after 10 years, whether it's going to work after 20 years. We do not know. At this point of time, it's very, very expensive, actually. But that is where, unless we do these things indigenously, I do not think we can uh, manage these kind of things. But, you know, stem cell, at the same time, with, with the population level and the pregnancy level, the amount of stem cells, uh, cord blood cells, which you can get in this country is no other country can get, actually. Therefore, if we have a policy to store these cells and use them for therapy, or at least immediate therapy, autologous therapy, as we call it, that is, to the same person, you can easily give it. Heterologous therapy is a bit, you know, to give it to another person, then you have to satisfy certain immunological criteria. But we have a great opportunity, at least in my opinion, blood-borne disorders, hematological disorders, stem cell therapy is a great, uh, right from leukemia and other kind of diseases, stem cell therapy is a great opportunity. But, pardon? No, it should become affordable, in my opinion, you know, over a period of time. Right now, it's very expensive. It should become affordable in our, definitely in our country. There is no reason why it should be so expensive. It will take a few years, but it should be affordable. Yeah, yeah. Who? Yeah. Insulin regulation. Uh, is there a way to uh, measure uh, glucose level from over the body, from over the skin? Without, without sampling the blood. Yeah, yeah. That is where there are uh, technologies available. I, we have supporting this technology where touch-based, he says he can measure the hemoglobin content. They can, you know, touch-based. Uh, such technologies are being developed. Right now, it is essentially a blood analysis, prick-based uh, analysis, actually. But non-invasive non diagnosis, you know, it is still being developed in this country. Glucose analysis is being developed, yeah. Pardon? Would be sweat or? No, not sweat. Right now it's blood only at this point of time. See, glucose alone will not be sufficient. You need glycated hemoglobin. Okay. Glucose alone will not be adequate. If you really want to follow diabetes, you also need to analyze glycated hemoglobin, both. That uh, needs blood sample. Um, I request uh, Mrs. Uh, Ramana to offer you a souvenir as a token of our gratitude. Thank you, sir, and thank you, ma'am. I now request um, Dr. Prakash Chauhan to propose a vote of thanks. Good evening to all. Professor G. Padmanavan, Chair of the session, Dr. Baldev Raj, Professor uh, Shubha, my colleagues of this uh, NIAS uh, DST 2000, December 2016 batch, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my pleasure and honor, in fact, to propose a vote of thank to Professor G. Padmanavan on the occasion of this Dr. Raja Ramana Memorial Lecture, which has been held uh, today at Diaz campus. And uh, I would also like to greet at this occasion the family of Dr. Raja Ramana, Mrs. Ra uh, Raja Ramana, and uh, Ms. Malati, though, who has graciously uh, been here and uh, was present throughout this lecture. Thank you very much, ma madam. 
on behalf on my personal behalf and on behalf of my colleagues for this particular course i would like to thank you profusely sir for giving an excellent exposure about the issues related to science technology and healthcare system in india in context to the global developments sir you you illuminated many of us those who most of us are basically from engineering uh, background uh, uh, institutions mainly dae isro and uh, certain uh, other uh, organizations very few are from biological background so we uh, i am sure that all of us has really got uh, benefited by the new things which you told about the vaccines the biogenerics and the biopharmaceutical research which is being done in india and most interestingly the synthetic biology components which was told uh, by you in this lecture so uh, sir at the end of uh, this as uh, we all say that a healthy mind needs a healthy body all of us agree is that this lecture has really illuminated us about the health related issues which are pertinent in our society and you have also shown us the path the a road map so for this let us all thank once again to professor padmanavan for his excellent lecture i also would like to thank uh, dr shiba for giving me this opportunity to propose a word of thank thank you very much thanks a lot to everyone thank you dr chauhan uh, that concludes the uh, session for today uh, we thank all of you and uh, have a good good evening